sake. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We Hello. are still waiting on um, one of our speakers, Guillermo. Um, but I ask that uh, if you can continue to keep uh, your screen or your audio on mute. We'll, we're all going to have a chance to talk and contribute here. Um, but and I know for the sake of time, I want to get going here shortly. But I'm going to wait just another minute. Um, I know Guillermo um, is uh, either just finishing up class uh, or some some extent, but we we do have uh, Reno and, and my fellow uh, co-host Kirk here. Um, it's a great great to see everyone rolling in. This is so great. Um, hoping for um, pretty good turnout. We've had about anywhere from twenty five to forty five on these, and and just to kind of paint some paint a picture of context here, uh, these are informal roundtables. Um, this is uh, now the uh, June, July, August, November. This is the fourth one that we've hosted. So we're going to continue to do this every month. This is not a webinar. Um, this is really meant to be two-way dialogue, two-way conversations around a particular topic. Um, and it just so happens today, we're going to be talking about fire modeling and evacuation modeling, um, among other things. And, and I am your host, Kevin Sofin, along with my other fellow co-hosts, uh, Captain Kirk McKenzie, uh, we have Reno, Le Reno, I'm in the book to your last name, Lavera. Yes, Reno. <laughs> Reno, Reno, uh, in Reno, we, tr in Reno, we trust, um, in Reno is a complete rock star. It is, uh, 10 AM for me central time, but it's 3 AM from the future for Reno, uh, based in New Zealand. So just thank you, Reno, for being here. Um, oh, we got, we got Guillermo here now too. So great. Um, so we got, for uh, everyone, grab an umbrella tomorrow. It's going to rain. Yeah, I can tell you. <laughs> no, what's the future look like, Reno? <laughs> uh, oh, no, great. That's great. Well, Guillermo, welcome. Uh, we're seeing some other people rolling. This is great. So we're we're just right on time. So this is perfect. Um, Guillermo, if uh, if you can um, put on your video, that'd be great. But uh, just to now, I guess formally launch it. We'll Guillermo, once you get your camera on, we'll we'll get for get going. But um, this is meant to be an open two way conversation between everyone. Um, we are uh, Guillermo. We have two distinguished guests here. Uh, Guillermo Rain, who is the professor of fire science at the Imperial College of, Jel of London, and Reno Lovjero, who is the um, leader of the Digital Built Environment at Mass University, and my fellow co host, Captain Kirk McKenzie uh, with McKenzie Smart, Smart Technologies. And I want to set, set a, I'll send a special shout out. Thank you. Uh, to to Loki, who's helping uh, kind of one of the sponsors of this event today. You'll learn more from Sam Matthews later, but Loki makes it easy to gamify messages and helps automate the training. Um, it does a lot of work in this realm of, of uh, modeling and, and, and digitizing and training. So um, kind of a cool, cool intersection there, and, and we'll hear from Sam later. So um, without further ado, um, I want to turn it over and, and first maybe get, allow both Guillermo and Reno to give quick introductions and they're mm. going to give about five or so to a 10 minute remarks and then we're going to open up to the floor so put questions in the chat come up with questions and we want to make this two-way dialogue but i ask please keep your your microphones on mute when you're not talking and try not to speak for more than two minutes at any one given point um, we want to get let everyone be able to have a chance to talk um so First, I'll introduce you, uh, Guillermo. Great to finally connect. We've had some good conversation on LinkedIn. So Guillermo uh, and Reno, if you both want to do quick intros and then can kind of get into remarks, um, that would be great. Yeah, excellent. So I'm, I'm Guillermo Rain. I'm professor of fire science at Imperial College London in the United Kingdom. From my accent, you would see that I'm not British. Um, not yet at least. Um, I'm from Spain. I study in Spain, I study in California, I work in Edinburgh, and for the last 10 years, I am in London. I created my own research group, it's called Hayes Lab, uh, which is a set of beautiful minds that are working on all types of fires, fires in buildings, fires in the forest. And we use experiments, computer models, and field studies to protect people and protect property and the environment, which is a modern ethos. Um, I, I pass it to Reno and then I say things about modeling or or how do you want to do this? Yeah, how about Re Reno, you give a quick little intro and then we'll turn into, yeah. uh, go into the, your remarks and we'll open it up after that. Hello everyone. 
I am Reno from your future, from tomorrow of you. <laughs> it's uh, 4 a.m. here of your future. And I'm based in New Zealand and I'm a senior lecturer in uh, digital built environment. And my research has been always focusing on human behavior in uh, disaster, but the core of my research has been always human behavior in building fire. And now it's expanding quite a lot on, uh, build in, on human behavior in wildfire. And uh, uh, my funny accent is because I'm Italian in my case. And uh, I've been uh, working in many different uh, places around the world, including NIST. I've been working at Lund University, Napier University in UK, and eventually end up here in New Zealand, at Massey University, where I keep doing research in human behavior in disaster, focusing on study how people behave and also doing safety training using new technologies. Thanks for that in terms of looking at all the different options with modeling and <laughs> behavior, um, so a lot of different pieces of, of this conversation. So um, just to kind of uh, lead us off, yeah, Guillermo, uh, Reno, if you both want to kind of open up with some, give us from your perspective, um, some, some insights that we can chew on and and everyone listen, take notes, and be prepared to sort of ask questions and, and give your two cents um, after. So uh, Guillermo, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be with Reno. Um, fortunately, he's so far away. He's actually down there, literally, um, that I don't get to interact with him as often as I would like. So thank you, Kevin, for creating this opportunity. And I'm delighted to, to meet you, Professor McKinsey. It's an honor. Um, and also, I see some familiar faces. And, and some familiar names. So my, my role today, I think, is to talk about fire modeling and Reno will be talking about um, evacuation modeling as well. So modeling is a big thing today. Um, that's good because modeling is such a modern tool of science and engineering that, um, suddenly I'm, I'm very large on my screen. Um, sorry, I pinned you, keep going. Oh, you pinned me, that's what happens when you're pinned, okay. Uh, it's because I am talking to myself, which is, is a little bit strange. Uh, can I make myself a little smaller? You know, I can unpin you if that if that was weird. Um, no, the, it's, it's just weird for me. Is if you do hide self view, so if Got you it. hit the ellipses, yeah, there you go. Thank you, Samantha. And nice to meet you as well. I, I fix it. No, I'm not talking to myself. I'm talking to you. <laughs> um, yeah, so modeling is such a modern tool of science and engineering. Um, engineers the, create the, the tool. Sorry, scientists create the tool and then engineers get to use it. And when I mean engineering, that's a, um, a bias, a professional bias of, of mine. What I mean is people who help to make society better. That's what I call engineers. Um, and then they use scientific tools. One of them is modeling, which is very modern. Um, remember, maybe 30 years ago, 40 years ago, modeling existed, but it was not allowed to get out of the universities because it was seemed like uh, getting this beautiful fundamental dirty. And, and there was a, a significant push in academia that modeling should not be used in the real world because it was too beautiful. And obviously that changed for the good. And engineering is, sorry, modeling is everywhere now. Think of all the multiple applications of com complex models, simple models, computational models, higher order, higher order degree models, high performance computing models. And it has led to a revolution and many of the things that we see today Many of the things that are happening right now as we speak are thanks to this type of modeling. In the context of fire engineering, it is very important to use modeling because fire is very complex. Um, because we know very little, unfortunately, about fire. We wish to know way more than the little bit that we know. And because experiments, which is still the single most important source of information in fire science, experiments are expensive, are cumbersome, and they're coming too slowly compared to the ability, the wish that we have as a community to see more experiments. In this context, modeling becomes essential. Uh, modeling cannot go ahead of experiments, unfortunately, but that's fine. Um, it's always lagging behind um, on, the, on purpose because models get their accuracy, their validation, their validity and credibility from the experiments. Uh, but then with the models, you can augment the experiment. It's not that they just you can only replicate experiments is that you augment experiments, you, you integrate experiments, you interpolate between experiments. And if done safely, engineers can also extrapolate from experiments. But that's a very dangerous endeavor. That's like exploration 
outside the solar system almost that you don't know what you're going to find. Um, but it's possible to do all these things with 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 models to make um, to make up for the lack of experiments that we wish we have, and for different reasons we don't have. So farm modeling very important, very modern, and the future is very bright because this has just started. When I was um, when I when I graduated from engineering school, um, farm modeling in the hands of engineers was controversial. It was being done. But it was controversial. There was still a lot of people thinking that that was not a right tool for an engineer. Uh, fast forward now, 25 years, well, more than 25 years, 30 years, and, and no one will put that into doubt. Now the question is how it is used, not the fact that it's used or not. The question is how it is used. Is it used appropriately? Is it used as a black box? Is it used as colorful dynamics or not? Um, and that's where I would love to, to contribute in. In, in how modeling can be used is the art of the science, right? Because the, the model is developed by scientists typically or with a scientific approach and then is put into the hands of society. And using the model has a lot of art. So it's the art of as a scientific tool. There is a lot of people that think that modeling is only scientists, but actually has a lot of art in it. I love that, Guillermo. I do think that there's that lack of sometimes focus around how the human element and the art behind how we actually make technology and bring it into the lives of normal civilians to first responders where it's not just ones and zeros in code, but it's it's people that interact with this stuff. Um, so I think that that the art of tech is something that that needs more conversation. So I um, I guess Reno, if you wanted to build on that, or Guillermo, if you wanted to, to you know, add on to that there. Um, I really, really like where this conversation is going. No, we, we can leave it for questions in case someone wants to develop that, but I'm, I'm happy now for Reno to go ahead. Okay. Yeah, Reno, the uh, floor is yours, and feel free if you got anything to share too. Um, great. Yeah, I, I prepared some slides because my face is not that nice to see at this time in the morning. So <laughs> at least you will focus on something else. I hope you can see the slides. Yes, we can see. Perfect. So fire and evacuation interaction, it's, uh, uh, I, I can tell that what Guillermo said about uh, fire modeling, it's really true also for human behavior and evacuation modeling. And there is quite a lot of challenge that we are facing. And most of the time I might say that the, the, the slow step we're moving forward is because society remember about us or in fire safety engineers only when there are disasters. And we get this kind of uh, boosting of uh, funding and possibility to do stuff as we, sh we would like to do every year only when there is a, a big nasty things happening the day before. Instead, uh, we need to train society to invest in safety today to avoid problem tomorrow instead of uh, try to figure it out why we weren't capable yesterday to save people. And I can tell you that there is quite a lot that we need to, to do to improve our modeling. Modeling, uh, of course, it's a, represent a model is a representation of society, uh, of reality, and uh, it will never be perfect by definition, but we can make it better and better every day. And this apply for fire and evacuation. To be honest, I come from another generation compared to Guillermo because I started 10 years uh, ago. And when I saw the first uh, evacuation simulation uh, through Enrico Ronchi, that is now associate professor in Lund, I was back then a master's student. I was fascinated. I was back then a structural engineer and I was like really fascinated by the possibility to do this kind of simulation. And then it became a like my uh, my path and my entire life uh, uh, direction for study and research. So I believe that modeling had a big impact in my life, but then I, I, I realized pretty soon that there was a lot of work that needed to be done to improve uh, what we had already 10 years ago. And the fact that you're capable to use a model doesn't mean you, you know how to click the button of a user in interface, doesn't mean that you are capable to do a, a good simulation. And that's where the engineers are required to use and squeeze their brain because it's not just an art of uh, 
plugging in the input and output and that's it and make sure that the, the software run you need to always make sure that you make the best of what we could do with that we have today and i can tell you that uh, um i mean the classic way we do safety now is try to make a comparison from what we get from uh, uh fire modeling and evacuation modeling and the big challenge that we've been facing uh, uh, so far is try to make the two parts communicate with each other and i can tell you that we have been doing uh, uh, some baby step on this direction on trying to figure it out of the far uh affect evacui and we managed to do something good to to to, un to understand this interaction but i can tell you that instead that the other way around is something that is still a brand new field. I try to have uh, results from an evacuation model that affect fire model. There are a lot of challenges because, especially if we use CFD on uh, from a fire hand uh, uh, point of view, uh, account for the possibility from the fact that there are evacuee moving in a space in a domain in which you have CFD simulation, and there is actually a dynamic object, a human that is not a cylinder, is not like a cube that move in the space. We like to model it in CFD when there is a fire spread with the possibility to open, close a door in a random uh, moment of the time, depending on the, how the evacuation simulation is running. So there is quite a lot that needs to be done. And we have also, uh, at this stage, uh, limited capability as a computational power if we consider the complexity of CFD. Uh, simulation and uh, probably we will look in 10 years back and say ah now it's so easy because we have much more computational power and uh, it's running a cft simulation is so easy that we don't need to wait 24 hours to just figure it out if we do if we did a right setup of a, of a simulation from a human point of view we have been studying quite a lot of uh, <clears throat> of the fire affected the decision to evacuate but in all this field, there is quite a lot that needs to be done, because even in uh, in experiment, it's difficult to quantify. It's easy to say, for instance, there is a fire close to a door, but quantify how this is perceived by a person, because you can imagine that the fire is not like something that you put there, and it's like like a signal. There is in many other variables that represent the, the can represent the fire. And uh, so we have been having a lot of things that go, uh, for uh, uh, the decision to evacuate. We know that affect, of course, the, the, the decision to evacuate, affect the exit choice, affect the evacuation speed. And uh, the first experiment were done probably 50, 60 years ago in Japan. And I, I can see here someone that is trying to do some new experiment in Poland and probably can expand on that. And uh, we have been expanding with data from Lund University. There have been new data from Japan and try to build a big data set. And Lund University, for instance, is playing a key roles on this. So in this field, we have been doing probably quite a lot. And uh, health. David Purser is probably one of the most important person that has been contributing in understanding of the fire inhalated and exposure to heat affect human health. And today we use the Fed model, but who knows in 10, 20 years, if we are gonna keep using it, or if we are gonna start using a more advanced way to uh, assess what's the impact of fire on human, because it's not just a matter of what happened during the fire. A lot of people might die after the fire because they get impact by inhalation of a uh, toxic component after one, two months, or even after months. Are those people that die because of the fire, but they didn't die actually during in the building, but they die after months? Are a lot of questions that we need to put on the table as a society and try to figure it out how to account for this problem. And this from uh, from me from in terms of slide, I won't do a class today. <laughs> and uh, let's leave time for uh, open question. Marino, Billy, Billy Freeman with the First Net Authority. I'm trying to stop sharing. Yeah, there you are. Hey, Billy, floor is yours. Thanks for, thanks for chiming in. Hey, 
um, have you have you expanded your modeling in this regard to multiple people? I'm a retired firefighter. Um, have you expanded the modeling to include uh, a, a parent and children? You know, I've seen I've seen people do a lot of weird things when it comes to getting out of a fire. Um, one person is, but have you expanded to it to multiple people? You know, I'm going to gra- try to grab my kids on the way out the door, that kind of thing. Have you thought about that? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a lot of flexibility. Back in the day, it was challenging, but now we need to say thanks. Uh, Brian probably can also expand on that. We have Brian that is uh, uh, one of the key person behind uh, Pathfinder that is one of the most uh, uh, famous model. And uh, I can tell you that now group evacuation is uh, much easier to be done because you can set up a way that uh, groups of people can evacuate together. And this is fundamental, for instance, in a situation like schools in which the evacuation is not like the evacuation of individual. You have a teacher with a group of children and they need to evacuate by themselves. And this is definitely more uh, uh, challenging and probably require much more time than uh, individual evacuating by themselves. It's something that we, we we can do and we need to also account always for affiliative theory. So we need always to link with the theory that says that humans tend to go with the familiar people that can be a familiar person, can be someone from your uh, family or can be someone from your own working team or people that you're interacting in a, in a room. We have the capability to do that. And uh, I hope people are accounting for that and not just uh, simulating people as a single individual when they do uh, those evacuations. For instance, in a tunnel, if you have people that evacuate from the same car, I might expect they will evacuate as a group. but. I can tell you that in some software, it's almost impossible to allow that. In other software like Pathfinder, now it's pretty easy to allow for this kind of simulation. I appreciate I that. That was a, that was a <laughs> good answer. I, I'm a fanatic about, about planning, fire escape planning. It works in homes. It worked at the World Trade Center with, Go, uh, I think it was Goldman Sachs had their security chief was constantly training them to get out. And he saved literally thousands of lives because they had gone over that planning. So modeling in my mind will show people, here's how it can work and here's how it won't because if you don't do it, it won't work. We we can definitely use as a training, but to be honest, I haven't seen it, unfortunately, much use for training uh, uh, here. At least I don't know if in US they probably Brian can tell us if someone is reaching out to him and they are purchasing Pathfinder uh, right. to for a planning point of view and show people look if you don't follow this uh, the instruction that we give you do, during drill look at the mess that you're gonna create in the building. Reno, I'm gonna queue up Brian in just a second here, and Billy, thanks for the question, very pertinent, and to me uh, one of the as a former firefighter one of the most interesting things and brian helped me out with this is what about human factors for firefighters when we have a mayday and we're working on a rescue uh and maybe we've lost one of our own and fire models are produced from cherry road Lawden, berkeley way a number of uh incidents that honor our fallen with an education and i said to brian gosh four four plus years ago it wouldn't it be useful to be able to be inside that fire model and under, and listen to the radio traffic recordings about what happened and to Billy's question the same for when we lose citizens in a fire now we're getting to have more and more data live video feeds some of the people that survive can tell us the decisions they made and then it'll help the professors who uh you know have been mentors for a long time thank you for being here so Brian thanks for Putting, being the first person to put me inside a fire model in VR. And um, please, would you tell us what a little bit about what you're working on at um, with Pathfinder, Smokeview, and um, and the rest? Yeah, sure. I, I didn't plan on talking or anything today. I thought I was just going to fly on the wall, so I'm not ready for anything. <laughs> no, nothing nothing yeah. formal. What do you, what yeah, do you yeah. see coming? 
or so, questions. Uh, yeah. Just earlier to kind of address, and, and I'm just getting over, I arrived back from, we just had the FEMTC in the Czech Republic. And of course I came home and a that day or two later had all kinds of fun nasal and, and throat cough issues. Tested negative for COVID four times so far. So at least that's not showing up, but my wife did test positive. And so she's been quarantined since we got home. But um, yeah, so just real quick, um, kind of talking about the influence of agents in the fire simulation. Um, not, and I mentioned that we were working on that a little bit. Um, the concept there is that we can use the trajectories from the Pathfinder simulation to translate some geometric representation of an agent in a 3D shape, maybe a geom object, which is coming in FDS7, or even just simple shapes like a cylinder or something, something to influence the flow characteristics of the fire dynamics, right? So imagine a cluster of people exiting a doorway. You're not going to get a nice laminar flow through the doorway at the base, you know, the classic neutral plane with flow in and flow out. You're going to have this obstruction to flow through all of the bodies on the, you know, on the incoming airflow, which is going to change the availability of the oxygen and and sort of create this drag effect as it's trying to feed the fire back back upstream. Um, and we'll have some kind of a drag effect as the fire tries to go out. Right? It's it's creating a turbulent flow that wouldn't be there if it was just an open hole in the wall with fire moving in and out. So moving people over time in the fire simulation, the, the concept that we're working on there is not Pathfinder specific. It would work through some intermediary data object, a data file that we could be updating positional data with an external tool, moving, you know, basically saying, move this agent to here now. So it would be translating in the next time step, FDS could be computing where that object should be moving to. It translates the object over time that influences the flow field. So anybody with any tool on the exterior side could be just updating the same file object, which would then just be, FDS would just be reading that and going, oh, okay, I moved the thing over here now and, and just doing that over time. Um, and so that's part of that. The other part is that, um, that, it, that agents moving, like let's say a door is closed and agents come to a door and the door opens or they open the door when they arrive at the door, that that should actually change the ventilation in the FDS simulation as well, right? So the door, this object should be removed or opened in the FDS simulation. And when agents pass through and the door closes again, it should change the ventilation again, right? So, so that there's this bi-directional coupling between what's happening in the evacuation and the pedestrian movement and what's happening in the flow field and the fire simulation. So that's that's something we're working on where the plan is to try to, you know, FDS removed um, the evac simulator from FDS, the evac module that Timo had been working on for years. That's That's been pulled out of the source code moving forward. So now there's not an integrated evacuation simulation or pedestrian movement tool in FDS. So what we want to do is try to create, okay, we just need some kind of almost an API or this intermediary layer where we can control states of things, where we can control pedestrian object or objects in their position over time with this data format. The fortunate thing with most evacuation simulation models is they run orders of magnitude faster than FDS. So they're basically just going to be waiting around for the next time step, next quarter of a second to show up or whatever, and then update the files. FDS reads those modifies its movement and then moves forward. So that's the plan. That's in very early development right now with NIST. Um, I've had some conversations with Kevin trying to sort out the concepts a bit and then see where we can do to move forward. Uh, potentially this will be another like a JSON file or, so, or some Fortran format, just something that we could just update this file, hopefully structured data. That would be my hope because it's a little easier to work with programmatically than just plain text files. But anyway. I, I, so that was the update about that. There's nothing yet. Unfortunately, I don't have a doc or anything. It's like super early in the planning, um, but that will start showing up in the FDS project and probably some beta testing and things in Pathfinder as we move forward. Um, and then the other question, I think with just, you know, we do have grouping, that's a, that's a capability. Um, there's also um, refuge rooms for the shelters of last resort. There's a refuge capability in Pathfinder. So there are some of these capabilities people have asked about that are that are available in the tooling. And, and we're always trying to add new capabilities based on what somebody needs. So if you're like, hey, your model doesn't account for this, like, please let us know so we can start working on making that be a thing. Um, and I think, does that cover it so far? Yeah, the moving you said objects. You said you didn't pre prepare for today. It seemed pretty prepared. Yeah, this is just on my head. <laughs> I just have this crap in my head all the time. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. That's what I get for doing this for 20 years. It's like, it just sits there and you're, it's always you're in the weeds, man. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. And then there was about FES moving objects. That's been a thing in the past. I, I don't, I don't know, probably 10 years ago, I had a little demo of a fastball moving through gas or whatever in FPS. Um, they pulled that capability out. They're kind of going back to basics, creating these new geom records, which are non-structured objects within the structured computational grid. So, and we, we support that already in PyroSim, being able to write geoms for objects, um, but it's really just a pre-feature for, for FDS 7. Um, and I think, I think that covers it, yeah. And so uh, Guillermo, did you, I was curious if, if based on what Brian said, if you had any kind of comments you wanted to maybe relay back to that. And I wanted to you know, kind of turn it op open to the rest of the people in, in the, the group to you know, continue to sort of ask away questions and give their two cents on this conversation. I, I wanted to react to the um, uh, implications of being able to simulate an event that is happening in real time. Uh, the example, I think it was Captain McKinsey was mentioning that his uh, forefighter has got trapped inside and, and obviously you know, that steps up the emergency response. Um, so we would like to use modeling in those situations and in any fire engineering situation in real time. So fire and rescue. This is something that is called forecasting fire dynamics, the same way as the weather was forecast three days ago. And in some of the locations where you are today, the forecast was accurate. And some of the locations where you are, and I am, the forecast was not accurate. Um, so forecasting fire dynamics is, is to say how the fire is gonna move, the fire and the smoke ahead of time in a way that the fire responders, the emergency responders can use to inform the decision-making. Um, typically it's not a, it's a if, if and when this becomes available, this is an additional layer of Intel that the fire brigades could decide to use or not, depending on the level of accuracy and, and the ability for, for them to, to receive another channel of information because I've not, I've never far fight, I'm not a far fighter, but I know they, it's a stressful situation and they already receive a lot of information. So this could be an additional one for them to decide. Um, but uh, forecasting for dynamics is a fascinating topic. It is definitely in the science realm. It's not ready to be used in the real world, unfortunately. Little by little, we'll be moving forward. I, I worked on this about 15 years ago, and, and it was it, it's really hard. It was really, really hard to do a forecast that was valid ahead of time. So this is measured by what is called um, uh, the, so the, the time of validity that you have of, of a forecast, for example, in weather is typically three to four days. Uh, here in the UK, the weather is very difficult to forecast. You, you can still get forecast for four or five days ahead, but there is a disclaimer at the bottom that says that they produce the forecast, but they know it's, it's of low value, right? So the same with fire forecasting, you, you want to forecast several minutes ahead. I mean, ideally at least 15 minutes, otherwise you cannot really do anything with information. It is extremely hard to see what the fire is going to be in the next 15 minutes. Really, really, scientifically, is one of the hardest problems I've ever encountered in my life. And I'm, in fire, one, one encounters a lot of hard problems. But there, is, there are ways to do it. There are, obviously, you need sensors. You need to have information of where the fire is right now, uh, the same way as the weather is forecast. They have sensors all around the planet. And then they feed these sensors into a computer model, high-performance computing. Uh, some of the biggest computers in the world are forecasting the weather and, and they, they produce a forecast and then that is uh, information. So we want to do the same for the firefighters. We're not ready to do that. We are in negative lead time. Lead time is a time of validity of the forecast. Negative lead time means that the information, the valid information arrives when the phenomena has already taken place, uh, which is, is sad. Now, 20 years ago, the lead time was minus three days. Then 15 years ago, when we work on this, the lead time became a few minutes negative. Uh, I am convinced that if someone is to do it now, and in particular, it starts to use a tool that had not been used before, which is artificial intelligence. They start to use um, fancy and interesting neural networks, and they train the networks with a very wide range of experiments and convinced they could reach positive lead times. I don't know if it's going to be seconds or minutes, but we are getting there. I saw this at uh, the university, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Um, one of their researchers, Professor Xinyang Huan, 
had recently in, in a conference in the summer presented a paper where this is taking shape. The, the paper was not focused on forecasting for dynamics, but it's just a matter of rephrasing the work they did and using artificial intelligence and a lot of experiments, they were able to see the future. That was fascinating. So if this continue, if this work continues, we, we might be able to be there, but we're not there yet. And, and certainly uh, very early in the work. Thank you, Professor. And that reminds me, and then I'll open up the questions for the audience. Uh, Dr. Ed Chow led uh, the Audrey AI program at NASA with uh, Department of Homeland Security, which we did a little supporting of uh, giving thermal data because he says, Kirk, I think with a an IR or near IR camera, a low cost camera on a firefighter, I can provide actionable intelligence on a backdraft or flashover, a hostile and fire event, a rapid fire growth far enough in advance that the firefighter could avoid the danger. And uh, with, uh, and they trained their algorithms by looking at videos, uh, one in particular of a garage fire of, and the object recognition could tell the difference between the smoke and the flame and the velocity and sure and predicted a, uh, a flashover. So to your point, as we get into connected buildings, if we now have maybe 40 to 50 billion, uh, billion connected devices, I hear in the next 10 years, we're talking a trillion connected devices. Uh, some of the teams I work with uh, have right 400 million phones in their domain and 10 million smart buildings. Well, with intelligent smoke and heat detectors, right? We can, if we can imagine it, uh, maybe we can get there with edge compute and the rest in due, in due time, all in due time. Reno, yeah, please. Yeah, can I throw my colleague under the bus? Chile and I have been working on uh, trying to do real time forecasting for human, uh, for evacuee in the wildfire, for instance. And uh, probably she can spend a couple of words to explain what we are doing. And this is done because when we have a large scale evacuation, we have the possibility to use GPS data. And uh, the idea is that if we can, uh, we have been so far using historical data, but if we can get access uh, a digi of GPS data in real time, then we can start doing forecasting. Shilei, would you like to spend a couple of words on that? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Reno. Um, hello, everyone. So this is Shilei Zhao. So I'm so we are working on a project that using trying to using GPS data um, to facilitate um, real time forecasting of traffic demand uh, in the future in a real uh, in a real wildfire event. Uh, so we are look uh, we are looking at those kind of people cell phone trajectory data. Uh, and we're hoping to get it for daily delivery, but currently those data delivery will have some latencies in there. So that's the major challenge right now and we are also gathering information about you know the real-time fire spread um, and uh, the traffic network the social demographics at the zonal level so we're incorporating all those kinds of different information all together into a deep learning model to try to make this model uh be aware of the real situation in a uh, you know a quickly fastly changing uh, wildfire situation, so the model can adapt to those scenarios and to make better predictions uh, um, in in real time. So that's kind of the work we are currently working right now uh, with the funding provided by NIST. Thank you, Chile. Uh and who else from, from the audience who has been holding their tongue with a question or statement? Yeah, and I, I'd love to, uh, I know Sam Sam is here, and I want to let um, you know Sam from Loci, uh, see, is, is there a hand up somewhere maybe? Uh, uh, yes. Oh, we'll we... check, we'll check, yeah, we'll check. We'll check. Uh, hey, hey. Uh, my, my fellow podcaster friend. Hey, bro. Uh, <laughs> and you got a great setup, by the way. It looks good. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts and two cents on uh, everything you've been hearing so far. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, I have a genuine question to, to Professor Rain and Professor Rodrigo. I mean, th there's a lot of development in the field of modeling, how a lot of interesting, sexy technologies being in introduced every year. You see them on conferences. They're beautiful. Uh, I don't know, response in re response surface from Gantt from a few years ago, I thought that's going to be a hit predicting outcome of uh, any scenario in a building from a certain number of, 
of um, of fire simulations, but many, many progress. And yet I go to the office and I do my modeling mm -hmm. the same way I did it 12 years ago. Like literally, I, I can use a little denser mesh because my computer is a bit faster, but I do it the same way. Like the same, the same way I've done it the first day of my job. And I, I wonder like how hard or where are we failing in moving these technologies from the realm of, of uh, science and, and fun into realm of, of reality, you know? Because in the end, I may have a most sophisticated modeling approach in the history of mankind, but I'm gonna lose the contract to the student who just download that at the AS and will do it for 50 pounds an hour. And uh, th that's a brutal reality for fire engineers out there. So I wonder how, how can we do anything to, to like promote this uh, growth, you know, to, to somehow disturb the, the state of the engineering at this moment? Cheers. <laughs> can I, can I react to that? Thank you, Bochi. Uh, what Bochi is describing is deja vu. Uh, I, I, I subscribe what he has said. It really feels that we continue doing not just him or I, it's just we as a collective community it feels a lot like we are doing the same for the last many decades. Um, that is true, but in reality, there is progress. Um, the tools that we use, although we might call them the same, FDS, ANSI is fluent, they, they have evolved themselves. And the computers where we're running them in reality, it's not that just they're faster, they you know the, the, the software and the hardware has evolved. But fire engineering maybe has not evolved that much. One of the reasons for that, which is something that I've been thinking for a very long time and I still not reach a conclusion, but I'm reaching convergence towards the problem of fragmentation. We as a community are heavily fragmented. I am, I've, I've seen many communities. I, I really like uh, interdisciplinarity. So I really like to talk to other disciplines and learn from them and try to bring lessons and tools and concepts from them. Um, and I've never seen a, a, a community that is as fragmented as ours, as the, the fire safety community, fire engineering community, fire science community. And it's a pity because absolutely everyone around the world in a building or in the forest has, has the, the hazard, is exposed to the hazard of fire. And the solutions are very similar, no matter where you are in, in time and space. Um, and, and that makes us even smaller. So we are a small community, take into account. I mean, all of you in, in this call today, you, you know that in your family, you are the strange one. You are the one that they ask you, what do you do? You do fire? What is that for? No, I mean, literally at, at Imperial, everybody thinks I'm a firefighter. I wish I was, I'm not even a firefighter, <laughs> I'm a fire scientist. Uh, so, so we are a small community. We are best kept secret from citizens around the world. And we ourselves are fragmented, which makes us even smaller. When you have a, a small fragmented community, it's way harder to progress and to embrace new tools and new concepts. And, 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 and that is, I, I think, maybe what Boje is referring to, which is something that I've wondered in myself. Why, why is progress in this community so slow? Being such an exciting and amazing, fascinating topic. Fire and saving lives. I mean, it doesn't get better. I agree. <laughs> Um, I'll just uh, jump in there because I really love what you're saying, and um, I uh, this is sort of my where my passion comes in, which is how we break out of engineering circles, fragmentation, siloing of information, and have conversations like these. That's why I love Kevin and Kirk so much. They're just always facilitating incredible cross cross pollination in this community. So I just want to thank you for that, and um, yeah, so. My background is um, in live streaming turned 3D on the web. And I uh, DJed for years and played really big festivals. And so I've seen large crowds under my control, which is a very bizarre um, and unique feeling to have. Um, and so I became kind of interested in uh, crowds, obviously, from that perspective. But then um, when I started working in 3D, specifically in uh, 3D scanning of environments and hosting them on uh, web servers so that we could plan um, a festival or plan a film shoot uh, virtually in a 3D environment together with assets that we pull in and save a bunch of money on travel and hotels and things like that. So that's how it started. And then um, 
I was using OASIS, a multi-agent system um, that's generally used for uh, pedestrian planning, um, but I had adapted it because it was really easy to change the agents to say, hey, this person is drinking, this person likes dead mouse, and I could set them all loose into a festival um, and see where they're going to go, where there's going to be lineups and stuff. Now, I, the, the fact that like um, festivals don't use this now to this day like blows my mind, especially with crowd crushes. Um, but this is where the idea for exit test came. I saw that we were able to put a bunch of agents into a scene and that you could visualize the exits. And for me, um, I am big on the neuroscience of memory. And I know that place is the strongest, uh, loudest cells that fire in memories. And so um, in order to create that path memory that's going to be resistant to the panic of and, and the sort of social dynamics of a crowd, you need to have something that's, you know, triggered in your hippocampus, um, in your limbic brain. And that comes from visualizing a route. And so I knew that if those agents are already going into the scene, it would be pretty easy to attach cameras to them and start to break that out into something that might actually touch the end user, the person, right? Um, so exit test is designed to reach end users. It's, it's designed to take this fire modeling, fire simulation out and put it into the hands of those who actually act, are responsible to actually train those people. Um, my goal in life is to uh, eliminate all evacuation signs from every building and structure on the planet um, and replace them with um, highly contextual fly throughs from how to get out from that place. Um, and to build preventative training um, that actually meets people where they are, which is the fact that we have these ancient brains that don't read flat maps well, um, and that we've sort of lost our this, uh, agency to, or sort of ability to do that as we've become more reliant on GPS. And so I guess to sort of answer the like, who's breaking this out, I'd like to say, I'm trying to break this out of this scene because I think what's beautiful about modeling is that you're basing it off of real people and, and people learn best by simulation. So it's not a difficult thing once you have that complex environment built. I think the biggest challenges and my biggest frustration is seeing how many people are duplicating their efforts. Like you have the BIM and the architects modeling the building and then the fire safety can, people are like, I'll model the building too. And then, other people will model the building and then somebody comes in and makes a map of it. And it's like, why? <laughs> um, so I think to your point, it's really important that we have these conversations, but also that um, we don't forget who this is for at the very, very end of it all. Um, we're ultimately trying to save people's lives and we can kind of forget that we are people too. Like we, as engineers tend to treat people like these complex, stupid problems. And like, but it's like, no, no, no. If you put yourself into your own person, you're like, no, what would I do in this situation? And so um, I'm really hoping that by understanding that, man, if somebody just showed me this fly through or showed me what these engineers see, I wouldn't have such a hard time. Um, and that, yes, yeah, so that's, that's what Loka is doing. And so I'm, I really encourage anybody who is in the modeling space, if you want to work with me to turn your, your modeling into training for whoever's going to use that place, please reach out to me. That's what we do. Sam, I, I want to say thanks for your brilliance. Uh, every time I talk to you, I keep uh, getting the impression you know a lot more than I had imagined. And uh, so to you um, and uh, uh, Reno and Professor Ryan, uh, the, the question to me is an, at scale. As you say, you have BIM, building information modeling, and we have CFDs, computational fluid dynamic models, in the lab, how do we get it out into the space? And one of the things that's coming up to me, for me, as we as we build out, and I'll ask the professors to answer this for me, as we build out platforms to escape harm, I like the term 911 go, everyone should be enabled, whether it's fire, active shooter, earthquake, flood, natural disaster, whatever it is, we should be able to escape harm in mixed reality just by pointing our phone and knowing where the exit pathways are and maybe where the hazards are if we have real-time IoT feed. One of my questions is, what do we do with open source photos to make a giant nerf for the whole world to help with modeling and exit pathways? Has Could somebody tell the audience, because I barely understand professors, what, what is nerf? And how do we and get there? You want to give your hot take on that and then we'll, we'll let Guillermo go. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, I mean, as was somebody from, I saw somebody from Esri here, I think like the, the toughest thing, like we, right now we're rebuilding, we rebuild the earth from open, 
like Google data, I can, um, if you want to see just an example of what it looks like um, with open source, um, no, no sort of streaming data. Um, I can pull that up here for you one second. Um, and then the, the key thing is, is that what, if we I'm not seeing your screen. That, pardon? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, I'll just pull it up here. Where did it go? Data Studio. Um, so we're, this is an example of, um, perfect. I see, uh, I see oh, this. Right now. There we go. Um, so this is an example of the, oh, here, I actually have to open up this thing. Sorry, I have to share my screen. Here we go. Um, so we pull in about 10 square kilometers just from Google Earth, and then we drop agents in um, that have cameras attached to them. This is to help truck drivers arrive to a, a ferry terminal where there's a high powered gas line with no turnaround. So if they miss their corner, it causes kind of an issue. Um, and, and so this is just an example of like using simulation, but having cameras attached to those agents in the scene. Um, so I think you know, you can see that from here, like it's, it looks like it would on Google Earth. I think the main thing is you don't need to make everything super perfect, but to Kirk's point, you need, we, we have the ability to create um, a shared context and, and work from that um, and sort of add our models or add our other things into that. I think I was really encouraging to hear Homeland Security um, a couple of weeks ago. They've been working on the active shooter thing in Texas with some of my partners. And they're um, really turning towards game engines and not mapping individuals or all these different platforms that have proprietary data, but saying like, okay, we see that there's a whole bunch of layers of proprietary data. We know Esri has a whole bunch of ecological data. We know NASA has a whole bunch of weather data. And we actually like the only place that we can pull this all together is in a game engine. And so I think that's the sort of like, will be the place we all meet is like, luckily we have these AAA game engines like Unreal and things like that, that can handle the physics and all the science that people like Guillermo and Reno create. Um, and so I think the, the turning point will be when large institutions start to realize that they need their own game engine environments if they actually wanna analyze all this data. Well said, Sam, Guillermo. No, I, I didn't want to add because I don't have many answers. So it just, I wanted to ask Samantha for a clarification. You, you said that you want to remove all the evacuation signs, which in fire engineering is tremendously controversial, which is fine, but you want to replace it with, with something. I didn't get what you want to replace yeah, so it with. So the idea is like right now you see, you see a flat sign and I, as a person have to close my eyes, picture where I am. Okay. And in order to trigger a place cell, which is the closest landmark nearby. If I don't trigger a place cell in relation to that map, it's not there. And so to trigger a place cell, I need to actually get dropped down from a context. Like you see, I don't know if you've noticed how much better Apple Maps has become. They're doing a tremendous amount of science on how people actually understand spatial information. And the pathways and the context in which they're zooming in and out is designed to continuously create that context for you. Um, so the, um, sorry, your question was, was did that, that, that answer your question? So you um, want to replace the sign? So I want to, oh, sorry, so to replace that, I want to, um, um, create screens. Like there are, like okay. rather than have that, that are just showing you from where you are, primary, secondary, primary, secondary, primary, secondary, coming in from the earth, like dropping you down to where you are, showing you how to get out, dropping you down to where you are, showing you how to get out. Cause that's what the purpose of that map is but it's got so much extra shit on there. And I have to close my eyes and visualize it if it's gonna work. And so if we actually design signs for how brains work, especially if it's like, I just need you to know how to get out of this building in an emergency from here, then that's the only information that we should be displaying to people if we wanna truly reach them. Thank you, thank you for that. That's actually quite exciting. That reminds me, and I, um, uh, this allows us to connect to topics because uh, Reno and Sile has discussed um, evacuation model in real time, and you are describing dynamic signage. I think that is, that's the scientific name because there are a few papers coming from down here in London, in Greenwich, the group of Ed Galea. I think the name is dynamic signage. And my understanding is- I love that you just said that because there's always a term that like unlocks the whole internet <laughs> for me. And it's the like, keyword. somebody has come up and they're like, oh yeah, it's a risk auditing engineer. Look that up. You're like, 
What? Thank you. So it's, it's, so no, it's, it's essential because now you will find their papers and Rino and Kay yeah. Kaylee can send you there. And I think that's what they do. These are signs that react to the specific situation that they know is happening. So the evacuation route is not casting a stone. It, 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 was, it changes with the fire. Uh, this actually also links in the future, will link to forecasting fire dynamics that I described before. And, and, and with a triple connection there, this is something that, although I, I discussed this before in the context of building fires, this is something that also is tremendously potential in the, wild front, in the wilderness. So this is something that California is extremely interested in doing. It's not just reacting to where the fire is, but actually to foresee the fire position hours ahead. And this will inform, should inform, it will inform in the future evacuation plans in communities that find their their location in the path of, of harm and how to evacuate them. In the future, all these modeling technologies and sensors and decision making should come down to one platform. Um, I am convinced it will happen. I don't know if I will retire, I will be retired by then or not. That's my only concern because this links to watches I question is this will be fascinating this can be done um, there is no technological impediment right now to do it everybody will would like to have it especially those that are say their safety is concerned um, why is it not happening then or why is it going to take more years than than for me to see it in real time because I will retire in 20 years something like this um, but the, the, but it's, it's, it's really interesting how actually everything comes together and at this point in the conversation thank you so an hour is never enough. It, Brian, you want to go? And then after Brian, I'd, I'd like to, I know, uh, Mateo, you had a question, Anthony, you had a question, and an hour's not enough. So we might go over 10 minutes late. Feel free to, to, to hop off whenever. But um, Brian, um, what, what do you got for us? Yeah, I have, I have two two questions, comments, I guess, on, on the last bit. Um, one about game engines. We spent about a year trying to see if we could get Pathfinder in game engines, and we ended up just rebuilding Pathfinder. Like, it's a huge effort to get technology into any system and any framework um we we were using i i think we were using unreal engine for that one we tried unity and unreal and like <clears throat> there what we ended up doing was like well maybe we can just make a visualization tool in the game engine and that's all it is so we run the simulations in pathfinder you have to build a model and dedicated tooling but then it might end up putting things in the game engine um and then we ended up going, well, the lighting's not quite right. It's kind of a shortcut to lighting. So we want to get more realistic lighting. Then movement is a little funky. We wanted to, and pretty soon we're like recoding game engines. So we were like, all right, we're just going to move back. So I, what I, what we found is that a lot of these engines to be performant take a huge amount of shortcuts. And that's where science and entertainment start to diverge is like, what shortcuts do you accept? And what shortcuts are like, now we're just pretending things are real like and so that's where we were we were finding things interesting like what are these shortcuts why are they taking these shortcuts are these acceptable or not for entertainment versus scientific representation um and we kind of ended up falling back to like well we'll just invest more time in making our results viewer more interesting you know or more realistic because we have full control over that and we don't have to rebuild game engines and bring on all of that technical debt that comes with like adopting a mega platform or something so anyway that was that was interesting it's a struggle we because we were like oh brilliant we'll just chuck everything into game engines and everything just runs like a game it'll be perfect and then we ran into all these snags i think for some applications it's excellent you know there's even like rudimentary pathfinding technology in a lot of these game engines they have navigation tools like you know but as soon as you start looking at that you're like oh okay this is just a simple thing that doesn't really account for this and that and now you're adding behavioral models in and you know so um it's an interesting problem anyway i'd i'd like to know more about what you know i know reno's worked in this environment a lot too and probably can even speak to what i'm talking about as well the other the other thing that i thought interesting is the real time stuff is is a very similar set of problems that in my experience is that the more real time or faster than real time you can get the more assumptions you make the more shortcuts you take that you have to get rid of reality uh, to get to something faster than reality, right? You have to start like not accounting for this. So we we skip pressure, we skip air drag, we start getting rid of this and that because we have to do these simple algorithms to run faster. And I think that's been the struggle I've seen people grapple with and that we've even grappled with is like, what part of reality do we ignore to be faster, to get something good enough to be like helpful, right? Like to, 
to say like, it's a good enough answer. It'll at least give us something more than just ignorance, right? It, we have something to work with. So I, I feel like that discussion is probably what maybe needs to happen more. And that goes to the question about detail. Like we try to be detailed because we're trying to get as close to reality as, can, as we can to make the best predictions possible. But maybe we can take some steps back and say, well, yeah, that, that will give the person's position within a meter, but really we only care about bulk movement or some global thing that doesn't really tie to any real state. It's more of an abstract state that we want to know more about. So um, th those two things came up about game engines and real time. It's like the same problem of like, what do you ignore? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like what, 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 how do you step back from details and just get like, oh, that's good enough. It's an answer I can use. It'll make a better choice. So um, I'd like to have more conversations about that anyway, moving forward. I would too, Brian. I think I just wrote down frameworks of level of detail because this is as we bring on customers, like that's the tension I've been trying to find. What's the correct level of detail that will actually make this affordable, scalable, and still useful? Like we know right now that they have no fire safety training, right? So they're in an unacceptable place of knowledge, right? And we're over here worrying about how we're going to fit all of our details and knowledge together. And we have to stop and choose, okay, for just helping people get out of a building, what level of detail can we hand over as engineers and modelers? Because we have to stop and hand that over to handle that. Then, okay, well, what if there was just a simple fire with no wind in this part of the building? Like, let, the, the, let's add that dynamic and then say, okay, at this point, this is as far as we can get before complexity will slow us down to a point of not being helpful for this realm of information. And then we can kind of choose, okay, but I think this is where we fall down. I see it in every realm of engineering, like people trying to solve all the financial problems of the world and they're going off and trying to build a completely new system from scratch with no flaws, right? It's like, we forget that like, we still have to fit this into the real world. It's going to have to fit into a plug at some point in the process, right? And so that the, the I think we're as engineers in this group, because I think we're a passionate group, we can decide who needs what level of detail in terms of a role directory of people outside, like occupants, like a guest, to an employee, to a contractor, to somebody who's in charge, to somebody who's responsible, right? And then say, what level of engineering detail could I be starting to provide that group with um, that we're going to be fine not getting into the weeds with them. Like we agree as scientists and engineers that this is the this is where we're at for where they are. Because I yeah. think what happens is we keep trying to model the whole world and everything to solve everything. This is the complexity yeah. gets and, the best and, of everybody. And, and and to point to that, like uh, Nazim Yaku, uh, he did some work with developing a Reddit a Revit add-in that will like take Revit data. Um, you can prescribe like occupant densities and room characteristics and profiles and things that will then generate a model in Pathfinder like as an import process. So it generates everything for you from the BIM. And then the output of the Pathfinder simulation goes back in and is stored back in the BIM model, but it's not the entire simulation. It's only the data that's relevant to exit you know, movement and flows through doors and things like that. And, and so we've like distilled down the critical information that needs to be stored in the BIM model and, and you could go back and look at the full detail if you needed to with the Pathfinder model, but you don't need all of that. And I think that speaks to like what you're saying, like what's the essential bits? Let's get that back in like the source of truth and then move move it forward through the process. So um, I'll, I'll post a link to his talk and we'll have a video coming up soon on all of these. But anyway, that's, that's great. I totally, I like that concept of like scaling and detail here. So I know I know we're over time, um, and I know uh, Dr. Dr. Rain needs to leave soon. But I, I saw um, Mateo had asked a question, Anthony had asked a question. Um, um, but I think before that, I was wondering if anyone would be interested in kind of doing like a group photo. Um, you know, I think maybe it sounds a little tacky, but just uh, but the, those that are here that are comfortable putting it going off camera. You know, we're kind of using this to continue to grow the uh, grow rate of thing, but we're comfortable putting your putting your camera on. We'd love to see your beautiful faces. Love seeing it. Oh, everyone, you look wonderful. So I'm gonna take the photo and in a on the count of three, one, two, three, biggest smile. Gotcha, Billy. Right at the last second. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so um, so and, and Guillermo, if you have to go, please, anyone has to go. But um, Mateo, you would ask a great question as well as Anthony, and I know we still have a little time, but um, Mateo, did you want to kind of maybe ask your question a little bit? Maybe you could get Guillermo to give a quick response and you can go. Um, and then Anthony as well, I want to give you a chance to ask a question too. 
yeah, mainly my question, I don't know indeed if Guillermo is doing any research about it is, okay, we are going a lot with more detail and I think that's right uh, for many problems, but often yeah, there is a lot of uncertainty on the input parameters we use. So for example, yeah. I think it's great to have the possibility to have moving people that might block or might change the stream of flow through a door, but how reliable it is I mean, uh, I bring a personal example. We do, I do a lot of tunnels and often the main assumption is people will leave. But the footage of tunnels where there are people standing in front of a burning car that they hear the alarm and you don't hear, and you see they don't move. And the person that actually did the video is in a car as well, taking a video instead of evacuating. So I think yes. here we are really going in detail on the, on the modeling side, but sometimes we are sometimes missing by far some behaviors that are completely irrational or they are irrational for us as a fire safety engineers or experts or professional who work with it every day but yeah we sorry my son is playing a bit uh <laughs> but yeah we are missing out some old errors somewhere else in other areas uh and i know from experience that sometimes it's hard to discuss this with firefighters for example because they don't really like the concept of, okay, we have a distribution of behaviors and we are going to accept that X amount of person will die or that we will not manage oh. to save them. So I think this is, it's a Pandora base. So once you open it, you have to discuss a million of things. So everyone is much happier if you say, okay, we take this fire size, we take this uh, A set, we take this R set, everyone is out alive. But sometimes I think there is, uh, yeah, uh, a bit of I, I I know I know Brian I already mentioned also in my comment that I already used the feature of randomization for the behavior and also I use the 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 input uh, the scripted input from Pathfinder and I ran a lot of simulations so but the problem was also to yeah how to convince later the authorities to say okay we have x amount of fatalities that we cannot avoid and I don't know if there is any active research on it because I think it's very complex topic, but I don't know if yeah, engineers yeah. or it can be solved only by consultants. Sorry, Sorry if, I if I can say something quickly before I leave. Very, very nice to see you, Mateo. Last time I saw you, it was five years ago in Warsaw or more. I, I didn't recognize you actually. Uh, so quickly is to say that it's actually a, com a conversation that I had yesterday in a conference here in London on farm modeling. Um, uh, when we compared to experiments, we went to prove the validity and the credibility of our models. We compared to reality. And this is how we convince the authorities, our friends, our colleagues about the goodness of the model. But then as engineers, we don't have to simulate reality. That's, no one has asked us to simulate reality. They ask us to use the model to design safety. Uh, and that's different because then we come out with, we have to design a scenario. We have to agree on, on, a, on a hazard that we want to avoid. And, and then, for example, we can see how people do this with hurricanes. They, they don't simulate against every single hurricane possible on the planet. They simulate against the one in, what is it, in 10,000 years hurricane, right? Or they do this in, in marine uh, industry as well. So in fire, uh, Mateo, I think you're referring to this. We cannot protect every single piece of infrastructure against every possible fire. We just have to make it safe to the fires, the authorities and the engineering team thinks that is the reasonable protection that is required. Um, this goes into the field of risk, which is probability times consequences and asking the authorities to accept that at some point, some people will die in the infrastructure is a very hard conversation uh, that I am very lucky to say that I don't have to have. Um, but it's true that people that accept risk, they, they, they cannot, assure 100% safety. They just have to assume safety at a high probability level and, and assume that sometimes things go, will go wrong. But that's actually a very modern approach as well. Um, risk, risk acceptance, risk uh, performance, and understanding safety as a, as a probability outcome, not as um, an assured outcome. Yeah, thanks for the explanation. Yeah, my concern was sometimes we're missing the major part because we have a bias considering that we know what's going to happen whereas the rest of the world doesn't know that there is a risk 
Thanks, Guillermo uh, and Mateo. So I think uh, one, Anthony, I know you'd ask a question and, and some people are, are, are trickling off. Um, and, and thank you, Dr. Rain, so much for, for your time. Um, Professor Rain, excuse me, for just Guillermo. <laughs> uh, Anthony, uh, you wanted to ask your question. Um, and I think we still got some people here who can have powwow on that. And you know, always appreciate you uh, being here, Anthony. Yeah, no, of course. Um, so I was curious, we had touched on wildland a little earlier in the conversation there, and was curious if there had been any work done on the inter uh, intersection of actual fire spread modeling and really location of shelters of last resort. Uh, the reason behind the ask would be uh, oftentimes you know, campfire stands out in my mind, right, where we ask people to evacuate. Uh, and often we'll find burned up cars, bodies, dead, you know, people just die in the process, right? And so to that end, has there been any suitability modeling discussions um, around, you know, shelters of last resort is what I've called them, uh, what I've heard them call it, but basically community shelters where if we do pull the trigger on evacuation, we can use some of the spread and modeling, uh, the predictive analysis to say, hey, we're not reversing four lanes of traffic, we're going to put folks into some sort of community shelter, that kind of thing. I can say that there is quite a lot of money that have been uh, pulled in this field by NIST lately. And I'm uh, trying to figure it out. Yeah, there it is. I'm trying to find the link of Unity. That is one of the latest simulator that has been created to, to gather a bit of uh, uh, both field fire and evacuation, and uh, it's a project that was funded by by NIST. And uh, if you wanna know more, you can uh, read the, the free report. You will see that there are different NFPA uh, reports, and there is I just put the one. What was the paper that got published by by my colleagues and Guglielmo is involved in that. And uh, I believe that this new generation of tools and is gonna help to, to answer your question. So the, the, the idea is to generate software that are free to be used, that can be used for planning, or hopefully in the future also in real time to, to make the forecasting as we were saying with the Chile, what is gonna happen tomorrow. Especially if you, you start asking people to evacuate in this area on that area, you will be able to forecast what is going to be the traffic on the network tomorrow and try to see if the, the, the strategy is going to work. Or in terms of uh, locating of a safety point, sheltering, you can use this kind of tool. Probably uh, my, 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 my personal perception is that we, we have done quite a lot on building fire. On wildfire, we are a bit uh, behind schedule compared to what we have been doing in, uh, in building fire. And that's why I guess many institutions like me start putting a lot of money in this because we are realizing that this is a key topic for, uh, uh, for engineering is becoming more and more uh, 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 bigger need in society because we have seen that the, the number of wildfires are becoming more and more higher year after year. And uh, it seems that finally society is realizing that we need to, to do something about it. So that will be my starting point if you want to read more about modeling. And you can reach uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Yeah, he's still a doctor, Enrico Ronchi, sorry, he's still <laughs> morning here. And uh, he can give you also more uh, an overview of what Wunti looks like. Awesome, thank you. Kirk, did you, Kirk or Sam, do you want to add anything else on that? I, I just real quickly, I just put in, for those who haven't seen uh, what the campfire looks like. I put in a 360 video uh, credit to Steve Cooper on that. It is graphic, it is hard to see, but it, it shows a little bit about the scope and scale of the campfire. And, and Anthony, thanks to Mike Cox and uh, Jack Dengagerman and everybody at Esri for the good work you do. Certainly there's a lot of teams that are working at a scale that's commensurate to your big group on like we have location data of personnel during their emergency and they are they are searching for certain things on the internet and there is ai that's telling us what roadways are blocked while they're trying to exit the area and some of the teams are saying 
uh, you know, this could be really useful for people fleeing, or maybe we say you're better off to shelter in place in a certain given area if we've given the hardened uh, facility for it or other factors. And then, frankly, the first responders need to have the reverse engineered mapping program to the scene, right? All the big mapping programs are not navigating personnel to the scene. They're navigating them away from the scene. And those personnel coming from maybe two or three hours away, they don't have the paper maps. So there's a lot still to be done in this uh, the space group. All, all good questions and comments. Thank you, Kevin. I was just going to ask the group um, how interested they would be because what, what I've loved where this discussion has gone is that um, we're trying to figure out where the pieces of action go into place now. It sounds like this is a group who's trying to not just talk about it, but figure out where. And I just wanted to gauge interest in bringing in um, some actuarial scientists to this kind of discussion. Um, so we're, we're engineers like, um, you know, Reno can show what his data is showing and then we can look at what the actuarial scientists are, how they're still writing it up. Because like when we speak about silos, I'm wondering if this is like, um, like when we talk about why these things don't change, like there has to be a lever to change it, right? There has to be some sort of incentive. And so I'm interested to know if people from this space are interested in having a conversation of this style with um, risk engineers um, and people who are underwriting uh, property and casualty for large enterprises, like even J joint power authorities that are dealing with um, underwriting whole communities that are in wildfire areas. Um, I've, I've found this an interesting area to work within because you can start to create incentives like oh if you put a fire suppression wall or if you do a, a week a, a yearly cleanup of all the brush off your grounds and then the insurance company can say if x amount of people participate you get x right and so this wondering if there's um connections that you have in your work we know i know we're out of time but that also if the group is interested in in bringing this discussion further into that actuarial space definitely we can follow up with the emails and try to see where we can go from here Cool. And uh, I see there's there's been a couple other people and we've enjoyed having you um, and feel free, you're welcome to say as little or as much as you want. Um, but for anyone else, you know, uh, Chrissy, Ian, David, uh, Daniel, Dario, um, is there anything any of you would want to say, a question, a comment, an insight? Um, you know, this is where we are past time, but if you've got a good question, you know, this is a good chance to to ask, and even if we can't answer it now, we can answer it later. Dario or Chrissy? No? No, no questions here, all good. All right, thanks Dario. Well, Chr um, Chrissy, where, where are you from? I'm originally from LA, but right now I'm in the DC Baltimore area. And wh what do you do, Chrissy? Um, Is it Loci? Yeah, yeah Loci. I'm with Loci, okay. I'm a software Great. developer. Great. Well, Chrissy. Yeah, I don't so, think you guys connected yet. That's awesome. Yeah, Chrissy yeah. was with us from from day one. She used to work in, in risk engineer, uh, insurance and data analysis, right, and right. she was like one of our earliest developers. And then she went and made a human, and now she's back. That's great. I'm back. Yeah. Chris, Chrissy and Dario from Team Loci. It's great to have you. And, uh, um, and they've been doing all the Mapton stuff, so they've been working on all of our Mapton integration into Loci, which is cool. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Uh, well, Chrissy and Dario, good to have you. And, uh, you know, Ian or um, David or Daniel, any anything or that you wanted to kind of add or final question or comment before we wrap up here? No, I, I'll just say it's been a great conversation. I'm very familiar with the work that Reno's been doing. It's uh, played a role in some of my master's and PhD research here just outside of Vancouver. Um, I'm not so much in the modeling side of things, but thinking about how people understand space. Um, and trying to look at how we can change their understanding of complex three-dimensional space through visualization has been a lot of my my research. So using uh, mixed and augmented and virtual reality tools to do that. So it's awesome. been great to be here. Well, I just put your I just, connect with Ian. <laughs> just put your uh, LinkedIn in the chat. And yeah, point of this is to connect and collaborate. So we want more of that. You know, Sam and Ian, please and. Uh, um, please reach out. No, honestly, I just I could do this all day. You guys are awesome. Thank you. David, anything uh, appreciate always appreciate you joining in and listening. Any any kind of comment or question that you maybe had around this conversation that you wanted to finish this off with? I'm trying to here we go. I was trying to get online. Oops. Um, so David Green from NASA. 
Um, yeah, I, um, thanks for the ongoing discussions and conversation. This kind of integrated information and visualization and gaming approaches is one that we're absolutely um, supportive of. Um, new ways of understanding what the relative relationship is. I'm glad you got to the discussion of scale um, and trying to demonstrate what it really means to bring scale to an individual's kind of decision or the context, as Samantha was um, describing. So I uh, really like the way this is going. Um, also glad to um, engage in some follow-up here. We are trying to do some pilot projects, demonstrations, and collaborations to move this forward. As Anthony and our Esri uh, partners, we've created and support a kind of a collaborative um, a community of practice in this area. So uh, hopefully we can follow up. Thanks. Great. Well, David, if you're comfortable, I'm going to put your LinkedIn in the chat. Um, you know, I think there might be. Yeah, a few. I'll also just put my email in there. Uh, awesome. It's too late. I already added the LinkedIn. You already added I email. did not put your email or your cell phone. An honor to have you here. So thank you very much for your. your I think your I put work. too many E's in my name. Sorry, it's just green like the color. Um, okay, take care, everyone. Thanks, David. Um, thank you, sir. All right. Well, I think that it, that officially wraps it up on uh, on all things everything. But this was probably the most interactive, dynamic uh, roundtable we've had. Um, just the fourth one today. We'll continue to do one a month. Um, what will the next month be on? Actuarial no science, creating leverage. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe that next. Uh, <laughs> no. thank, thank you. Thank you, Sam and Team Lokai. Uh, Wojcik, great to see you. Reno, Guillermo, Kirk, everyone. Um, this kind of community uh, of smart firefighting really uh, inspires me, fires me up. So um, we'll, you'll get a kind of a PDF report of what you heard in this chat, as well as the YouTube recording. Um, so continue to please share, engage, reach out, connect. That's the point of this. So um, thank you all. Uh, it's Wednesday, September 28th. 11:20 Central Time. I hope you all have an amazing rest of your Wednesday and Guillermo, or excuse me, Reno, great rest of your Thursday. Um, yeah. And uh, thank you all for your time today. Thank, thank you, you guys. Bye -bye. It was fun. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everyone. See you, Bill. Bye. Bye.